We're going to talk about Dave Landau and Steven Crowder and Anthony Cumia. We're going to hear it. Here it go. That's right. Dave Landau gave an interview to add a little bit more context to the Steven Crowder situation. And I think it's kind of interesting because here you've got a formal, I guess, disgruntled employee. And just to give some context, uh, Dave Landau used to work for Anthony Cumia. Anthony Cumia, you may know him from such things as the Opie and Anthony show. Back in the olden days when there was such thing as terrestrial radio, Radio you could pick up in your car with, like, antennas and things. I remember being a wee child listening to the Howard Stern show. And um, most people nowadays probably know Howard Stern from, you know, whatever he's doing. I know he still does his show, but he's like, America's Got Talent and other nonsense. And he used to be a, I guess, a groundbreaking shock jock, just as Opie and Anthony did. So, um, fast forward many years, you've got Opie and Anthony, they ended up breaking up because Anthony got fired for a series of tweets, and then uh, they went to Satellite Radio, XM Sirius got combined, Howard Stern I guess is still on there, Opie and Anthony got, uh, Anthony got fired again, and then Opie got canned a couple years later. And they went on to do their own things. And Anthony Cumia, and I wasn't much of a listener there, so I don't know that much about them. I do know that they were very comedy friendly. They were very comedian friendly. I remember Patrice O'Neill and Jim Norton being on their shows. Um, well, apparently, you know, Anthony had his own has his own show. He has his own channel called Compound Media where he does his own uh, commentary and comedy bits, and Dave Landau used to be a co-host on there. And then after uh, he left Anthony Cumia to join uh, the Steven Crowder show. And, you know, it's interesting because they talk about it because they used to work together, and I actually watched Anthony give a reaction to... Uh, the Michael Malice interview of Dave Landau to give some context. So I felt like there was some more context here, some more interesting components, because they break it down and they actually give, I'm going to play the devil's advocate. I'm going to give both sides because I could see Steven Crowder's opinion on this. I could see why there might be some reasons why he's right. And I can also see why Dave was like, I don't want to work here anymore. So, and he was an employee. And I think Anthony shockingly gives a nice balance here because he's a former employee of Dave and kind of gave his context. And that's where Dave was like, well, I worked for Anthony Cumia, who's a big deal. And I worked for Steven Crowder, who's a big deal. And, and, you know, they treated me differently. So let's take a listen here to some of the interview. I have a couple queued up, but I have some commentary and we'll try to work it out. Uh, the interesting part of the interview, it's about like 48 minutes long. I'm not going to bore you with the whole thing if you want to listen to it i will link the video i hopefully will do it here maybe i did it earlier maybe i'll link to compound media because you can check them out see if you like him for yourself the first part of it was interesting because they talk a lot about the rogan how rogan has created the comedy mothership in austin and apparently dave played there and gave some commentary on it how it's kind of like a copy of the of the comedy store and how there's three rooms and I've been in many New York venues and yeah, there's like three rooms and they're a little bit different. Each one has its own little interesting uh, components to it, but he, he just said like, this is clearly built by a comedian. Uh, Bill Burr apparently added some opinion to that. So I like that whole part. It's a little in depth in the comedian side of things. So if you want to check that out, you can listen to it. But here's where we start where I think Anthony actually gives a really balanced approach to this because he's definitely not just bagging on Crow on Crowder. He's kind of adding some context, which I thought was pretty cool. But let's listen and, and hear uh, what they have to say. This is about um, Steven Crowder and the possibility of him being hurt and how that impacted the relationship with Dave. That I heard. We had... We had worked previously on and off either together or separately with Steven over the course of the years. Uh, not much doing a couple of uh, appearances on his show and things like that. 
and then watching videos and and whatnot i uh, i just never thought it that he was like that and and what i wanted to ask you uh did did anything change with his demeanor after his surgery i understand like that could be a ptsd thing a lot of times if you have a serious surgery like that uh because he had that that uh, uh mm -hmm. titanium or whatever rib cage put it this is the one one of the things that dave's been real clear about he didn't want to talk anything about steven personally and i i remember him going i remember seeing on social media that he was going through something and it was something physical I didn't know what it was, and they're talking about like some sort of titanium rib cage or whatever it is. I don't know, but clearly uh, there seems to be some sort ben, of change. Um, you right. kind of reassess things, and sometimes it could leave you with uh, a lot of anxiety and and rage sometimes and uh, animosity. Uh, did you see any change after that? It's tough to say because yes, obviously, you know, it wasn't truthfully, you know, and I said it in that I, I took the show. Uh, I honestly, I thought you were moving and I didn't know where to go. And I mean, and that's, you know, uh, so I took it to go there. So at first it was definitely a different way of running a show, yeah. which I, I understood where yours is you're very much you understand comics and you also understand like the idea of like say what you want and do what you want you know as long as you're doing the job like you're not yeah, somebody I, who's I, just i call it lazy dave i call it lazy radio <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so i thought it was really interesting about this is <laughs> anthony is like he calls it lazy radio where essentially they just kind of get on and he lets the comedians like freestyle and do whatever they want i thought it was kind of refreshing because at one point they talk about Artie lang he's like i had Artie lang as a chair and Artie lang's a co-host and you know anybody who knows Artie lang knows his uh, difficulty with drugs and and uh his emotional state an unstable character to say uh, the least, you know, he's on like the number one radio channel of all time and he's falling asleep on the air and he's high on drugs and, you know, and so Anthony's like, Hey, you showed up every day and you did the show with me. It's not like you were Artie Lang who would just show up late, not show up at all. And I still didn't care. You kind of let him do whatever. And, uh, you know, Steven Crowder's show is clearly a uh, uh, well-produced more like Tucker Carlson type of show where clearly Steven is the in charge and there's there's not a lot of dialogue. It's more like here's a guy here to throw in some comments and we'll get further into that at one point. But let's just listen to a little bit more. <laughs> so you and I, we did it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like, dude, I really miss watching movies, man. That was fun. Oh, too. that was anyway. one of our our hit hit segments. Yeah, dude, and uh, it it's tough to say because there was a, definitely a lot of there was a little bit before that, and mm -hmm. then when he did have a surgery after and during recovery and everything, I I think I think some stuff has obviously happened, and I know he's got a target on his back. He deals with a lot of anxiety. He does a yeah. lot of that stuff, and. I think it's there is something there. I don't know what it is mm. um, because I don't hate him. That's the thing is I didn't want right. anybody to interpret this interview mm -hmm. as like hating him or anything else. Like, so I think that's a, a, another good point where uh, Dave is saying, you know, look, he doesn't hate the guy. He just didn't like the working conditions, and you know, maybe something did change. And and he clearly has a target painted on his back. YouTube was out to get him numerous times for all the various things people are trying to deplatform the guy. You know, Steven Crowder's a huge audience. There's a lot going on. So I, I kind of feel where there's a lot of pressure. He, he had certain expectations. But when you hire comedians, they're just not going to be able to fulfill those type of things. So I, I thought that was kind of an interesting point. Uh, and this is where it gets a not personal, but I could understand on Dave's side of things you know, where he was upset about something in particular where I could I could feel him the about this special thing. I I I was my jaw was on the desk during the entire time I, I was listening to you talk about that. This is your special. You have it taped. You're the one that draws the crowd. You're the one that makes them laugh. It's recorded. You want to put it out as a special. And somehow he somehow 
figured out or decided or that he owned it. Now, was there anything he said to you that you even went, okay, I could almost see that part of it? Because from what I heard, I can't figure out one bit of how he would muscle himself into that situation. No, um, he let me keep he let me no. keep the, the gate that night. <laughs> he got the gate. Uh, he let me keep the gate that <laughs> night, which is very generous, um, even though he did do a lot of the promotion, which and I'll be totally honest, that's why two shows sold out, not just one. I mean, OK, the fact that he was going to come back certainly helped draw tickets. Right. Right. Um, but when it came to like my actual material where I wanted it released and where I wanted it put out. It was it was always important that it was mine. I never sure. I never would give up my stand up. Even if even with the blaze, everything I specifically had an entertainment lawyer carve out, like, do not like none of that's yours. This does not belong to you. This is a separate identity. Definitely it's not yours. So that I yeah, that I mean, it bothered me a lot because it was sort of an you know, kind of an uh, you owe me this sort of a thing. So in his words, uh, here was this comedy special. And I think I know where Crowder was actually coming from in this sense because there was this whole thing about holding employees hostage. Like, oh, I'm going to fire these people if you don't give me the special. What I, I suspect happened from Crowder's perspective, and I totally understand Dave. Dave, it's his material. He's worked for a very long time. He says many of the stories are very personal. It's about his dad and his dad's death and his mom and his family and his whole thing. It's his intellectual property that he owns. But where I think he made the mistake was here he is uh, putting on a comedy special that he may not have been able to have the resources to do on his own. And Crowder's like, yeah, here, you can use three of my employees, my cameras, all my stuff. I'll promote it for you. You're going to do two shows. You're going to edit it. You're probably going to edit it on my time. So here he puts together the special, and Crowder thinks, oh, I have Dave Landau's exclusive special. Not that he necessarily owns it. This is like a record label thing, right? Where the record label doesn't, you, you, you might own the songs, you own the publishing, you own the rights to what you say, but the masters that it was recorded on, the recordings that you did are owned by the studio. And that's where I think Dave kind of misunderstood because he's talent. He doesn't necessarily get it where, you know, Crowder's like, I put in an investment into you. I'm the one who paid for all this. These are my employees on my dime. I don't think you paid them. I gave you the door. Like, I could see where Crowder would come in. I think it's a lack of communication. I think if they would have had a, a, a better conversation about it, where Dave was like, yo, this is really personal to me. Can I borrow? Like, I don't know. It didn't seem like they had real good communication here. So I could see both sides of this where I'm, you know, like I said, I'm playing a little bit of devil's advocate here. And I'm just trying to point out where I don't, I could see where Crowder had his own thoughts on this. This part's pretty funny, though, because as a comedian, you're just thinking to yourself, like, I'm here to contribute, and then they get this there this part Dave, here. The don't, oh, no, the don't talk light is on, Dave. It's <laughs> my turn it to on. talk. You're not allowed to to talk now. You can't I... talk. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's golf now. You can talk. <laughs> Look around. Hey, you hear this Tucker Carlson thing? It's crazy. Let me go off on it. No, Dave, Dave, no, 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 don't. Do you like? You want to chime in, Dave? Okay, go ahead. Say something. <laughs> I, I, heard I don't know. No, no, no. Wait a minute. I want to talk about the Tucker Carlson Don Lemon firing. And oh. Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> so Anthony has a really good point here. So in Anthony's, he would just say, "Look, let's have a conversation about this." Where, um, and I don't know, it, it, <laughs> it's probably due to the nature of Crowder Show being so intensely edited and intensely produced. Where, because it's kind of funny because they'd have a rehearsal where Dave would just have to sit in a different room and not listen to the rehearsal so that he could have his own fresh take on it. But Crowder was clearly like, no, this is my part to rant. I'm going to have you hit the button so Dave can't talk anymore. And we're going to clip this so that... Because you got he's thinking of how he's going to make a YouTube show, how he's going to build it, how he's going to take clips. He's going to have the Crowder rant because it's Crowder show and not have Dave contribute. 
I, I mean, I don't agree with it at all. You shouldn't have. I mean, I do have a noob noob button, but the noob noob button is I just slap him and he stops talking. But yeah, I, I get if you're a comedian and you're trying to interact and have jokes, this is not an atmosphere that's great. And Anthony's like, Ethan, you just do the show and you have a conversation. You, you just talk and you know how to have a give and take and you don't worry about it. But no, Crowder, and, and that kind of ties back to Crowder being the control freak where he he had everything very much manipulated where he wanted it to be. He di He didn't want any derivation from that. And look, man, it brought him a lot of success. But if you expect to have comedians to fill that role for you and have a uh, a role, they don't want to be constrained. And and Dave points out, he's like, you know, he's like that joke that I was going to say 10 minutes ago that was spontaneous. Yeah, it doesn't fit anymore. And, and that's what happens in a show with dialogue. I have it on my own show here <clears throat> where we do our live audio podcast and it's a give and take, and sometimes jokes don't work anymore, or a joke had its moment, and it won't work because somebody else was making a point. I, I get where these guys are coming from, and I, I don't feel that Crowder's show is like comedian-oriented. Again, I think I brought it up in my previous video where it's kind of like Jackie the Joke Man, where he's, you know, they're looking to feed jokes in to Stern to make him look better, or they're looking for Dave to feed jokes to Crowder to make him funnier. Um, because I, I honestly look, I, I think Crowder seems like he, he's clearly talented, knows what he's doing. I remember him fighting with Rogan on a podcast, which seemed kind of like, why are you being combative with Rogan for no reason? It, it just didn't make a lot of sense. He seems like a combative guy. Like he, he just is like used to fighting. I think he even sells shirts that you could buy about fight, you know, keep up the fight. Uh, but I see where like a comedian just wants to flow with it and he just wasn't feeding into that. And I think, you know, having interviewed a bunch of guests on our own show and having my own partner that I work with here, you got to have a give and take. And Crowder just didn't want that. He wanted a very scripted, a little bit tighter, more well produced. You need like three people on the board. You know, when you're looking at this. And you're watching our podcast, and I'm sure with Ant there's like probably one producer here. I'm producing, and and we're just talking, so it's a little less intensive. The last part is, I think this is a tough one because, as Anthony states, uh, I think Dave's from Michigan. I don't know that much about him, and he has a family or doesn't have a family, but I know he's a kid, and he used to commute in to wherever Compound Media is, and he would go work there live. And apparently that was the same deal that he had with Cr the Crowder show, but Crowder had something a little uh, bit yeah, different. Was, yeah. Involvement in your personal life seemed really overbearing. That's sort of what the issue was, was like, I never, you never really like, listen, you need to go tell your family you have to move to Harlem. <laughs> I'm like, listen, we got to go to 135th and Broadway. I just want my kid to have the best schools. <laughs> I want him out there getting beaten up on a yeah. school bus. That's uh... yes, yeah. I just I feel like my son should have black and eyes from Dominicans every single day. <laughs> what? Um, it, 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 that's what was so odd that I understood the idea. If you're making a certain amount of money, will your family come out? Will will this happen? Right. But at the same time. Other people have, say, jobs, insurance, health conditions, and that's what right. bothered me was regardless of a control uh, issue or something going on in his life, to me, it was completely neglecting any thought for anybody else. And I, I had to say it a thousand times, like, I, this is not an option right yeah. now. Yeah, deal breaker. So then it's, yeah, then it just gets shoved into my face of, you know, with that contract, and that's that's when I first started being like, all right. Like I said, that was last August where I'm like, I, I don't think that this can continue because it was, it was so insane. And you see people online that I, the, those are the comments that I guess are bothering me the most. Cause the main things are, I guess a tardy clause. And oh, what was yeah. the other one that I keep seeing some, which is, it's like, dude, you went to high school. It, <laughs> when I first heard the word tardy, tardy, I was in the office. I was like, what the fuck? Did, like, Does that what? mean late? Oh, late? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You mean, oh, not my abilities? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess yeah, the last two points that we'll make here is, yeah, there was a tardy clause. You know, if he was late to the show, he had to just like turn around and not get paid for the day. 
And you got to understand, and it's funny coming from Anthony, who worked with Artie Lang, of all people. Artie, one of the most brilliant comedians, one of the most naturally funny human beings on earth, who was an absolute train wreck as far as, and I would never want to hire Artie. I think he'd be a great guest, but I wouldn't want to work with him or expect to depend on him for anything. And, you know, and you get these comedians and and they are different. They're special snowflakes. They have to be treated different. Their talent or whatever you want. He he explains he was going to work hard, but like you can't expect him to show up at the same time every day. And he he claims he never he was never late for a show. So as long as he wasn't late for on air show, I mean, who really cares? You know, sometimes people have to do stuff. I don't know. I just I think the whole thing. Yeah, you know, it makes sense because Crowder was in a tough spot. He's trying to, like, position himself. He knew his days on YouTube were ending. He wanted to end up maybe at the Daily uh, Wire, (coughs) maybe at Rumble, which he did end up at. He's under a ton of pressure. But when you see Quarter Black Garrett leave and you see Dave Landau leave and you see, you know, you got to wonder what's going on behind the scenes. Is he cracking under the pressure? Is it too much? I don't know. What do you say? What do you think? Are you still a Crowder fan? Are you more on the Dave Landau side? I think Anthony Cumia kind of I mean, played a great diplomat here. I hope he, I, I'm, he's a legend. On uh, you know, regardless of whether or not I was a fan of his or not, I think the guy clearly seems talented. I liked watching his, his, his like <laughs> him listening to the Michael Malice interview, and then this interview is great too. I hope him. I hope everybody has a great relationship with each other. I hate to see people fight. <clears throat> I hate to see people in the same side fight. I hate to see people with rational minds and want to support free speech and comedians fight. So I hope everybody ends up in a great place. I hope Steven Crowder, I hope he makes Rumble a great place. I hope he, he continues to have great success. I hope Dave has success. I hope Anthony has success. So I don't know. What do you say? Are you picking sides or are you just hoping that everybody gets out of this clean? The one thing I'll say in, clo- in closing is that Crowder so far has been pretty smart in not responding and not that Dave's looking for a response because I think Dave's kept a professional and strictly about the contract and the, and his own personal gripes with it. Um, they, they haven't really been bag. He hasn't been bagging on him personally and hasn't given up too much personal information. So I, I say, you know, Dave's handled it pretty well. And, uh, Steven hasn't said a word. And I think the best thing for him to do is just let it blow over. Don't really bring it up. Don't talk about it. It's not of public interest and it'll blow past and uh, just keep doing what he's doing because uh, nobody's going to stop that guy. He's clearly a hard worker and uh, does a lot of work to do his show. So let us know what you think down below. Catch our live audio podcast. We've talked a little bit about it, but it's free to you, free to me. Thank you for listening. I thought I had some a little bit of insight here that could give a little bit of leeway as to which side. You know, look, you can't necessarily pick both either side because – Dave's hurt for his reason, and Crowder had his own reasons for wanting to move on. He wants a more professional environment, which is his prerogative. It's his thing. He's built it from the ground up, so he's got to do what he's got to do. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening. I'll catch you on the next one because I am on to the next one.